Uh, I'm glad to have you guys all out. We are going to be taking our weekday studies, our Tuesday and Friday studies, up to um, our Christmas day on December 26th. And we're going to be going through the life of David. So the, your outline has laid it out um, from the beloved to the beloved, the covenant to King David. Uh, pointing to Christ, really the Christmas story. So what we're going to be doing is just really honing our thoughts in on uh, how prominent David plays a role in the reality of Christ, which is our mediator. So I, I'm hoping that we'll prosper in this study over the next several weeks. We're going to be doing basically an excursion through First and Second Samuel to get us up to the Christmas story. So I'm going to open in a word of prayer, then we're going to um, talk about our, our study and then dive into it a bit today. Hopefully we can get through our first point so I can pick up um, our uh, next study on Friday. Father, we thank you for those who have made it out. Those who are coming, we ask for traveling mercies. Uh, and of course, we're asking for your grace now to help us pay attention and not only pay attention, but understand what your word has to say about uh, what was required for us to be redeemed and for us to know you in the pardon of our sin by your grace and in your son. So help us to see the relationship between you and Abraham and between Abraham and David and between David and our Savior and between our Savior and us. And we're asking this on the grounds of the forgiveness of sins and the the purging of our conscience from dead works, the freedom we have in Christ to, to call upon you and to know you hear us for Christ's sake. And we are asking this because we want to be able to um, transcend whatever distractions would hinder us from celebrating this season that <clears throat> you have granted the body of Christ for almost 2,000 years to actually acknowledge the incarnation of the Son of the living God with the angels, with yourself, with the shepherds, with all those who gathered around the birth of the Son of God in B.C. 7. <clears throat> and we are doing that yearly by your mercy and your grace in this free country. And so we want to actually honor you from here to the day in which we celebrate him corporally and collectively as the body of Christ. We're asking for healing. We're asking for strength. We're asking for um, provision for all here and all listening, whatever uh, situations and circumstances they might be in. You see it, you know it, and you have power to change it or to keep them in it or to grow them through it and us as well. So we're asking for this hour that you grant us grace to actually see Jesus in David, to see ourselves in Jesus to see ourselves in David, and so share as partakers of the grace of God that's in Jesus Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. So we're dealing with the topic of from the beloved to the beloved. This is a reciprocating dynamic. Um, it's rhetorical, as you can see uh, on our board and in your outline, from meaning origin or source, the beloved to the beloved, meaning destination, and when I use the term beloved, I'm using that term <clears throat> because that's who David is to God. And David is that to many of us. And that's who David is by way of his name. His name in the Hebrew, Dawid. Dawid means beloved. His name in the Greek, which is a transliteration, Dawid. David is also the beloved. And when you know your Bibles well, what you know is that the Bible really is a hymn book, and that hymn book is about Jesus. And the people of God should always be excited about that. But as you travel through the Old Testament, what you have to do is be able to see Jesus in that volume of the book, in the lives of the people of God, as they actually are called by God to represent Christ in some aspect of his person or work. So as you would have it on the front of your or on the inside of your bulletin as they open in common, opening commentary. I just want you to see it and grasp it because all people who read the Bible or call themselves Christians do not comprehend this central truth. Um, in our commentary, it says there's an interpretation of David as an eminent 
type of Jesus Christ. An imminent type of Jesus Christ, not a small type, not a minuscule type, but an imminent type of Jesus Christ in several representations. I hope to flesh that out over the next several weeks for us that bridges a significant transition period from the patriarchy to the monarchical period. And then it goes on to say, which is an application of Abraham to David slash David to Jesus. And I could also make the application to us. This is called the monarchical reign of David. And the monarchical reign of David is why we celebrate the incarnation. Uh, when men and women have the opportunity to celebrate, you know, the birth of the newborn what? King. king. You're only calling him King Kyrios Malach because his father was David and David was the great king of Israel. That's the only reason you're calling him that. So we want to build a bridge uh, fairly quickly from the way Matthew lays out the discourse. And we want to pick up on the language and work our way through our first point and our four sub points that I'm going to share with you. As we look at the story of David in the Old Testament, I'm going to call your attention to that framework and shadow and picture of the calling and the struggle and the sufferings and the triumph of Jesus Christ in the midst of it. May God give you an excited heart around this when we uh, talk about um, the monarchical reign of David and why we celebrate the incarnation and the rule of Christ today for which... Uh, for which Christ said himself in Matthew 16, 18 and 19, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Because that was true almost 2000 years ago, you and I as Christians actually are believers in Christ. Because what he said in Matthew 16, 18 and 19, and so I'll be quoting and you'll just have to keep up, Aubrey. Um, what he said in those texts, it, either it would have been true or it would have been false. Almost 2,000 years ago, not quite 2,000 years, somewhere around uh, 1987 years, <clears throat> um, but almost 2,000 years, uh, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That proposition for us means that there will be no time in the world where the church won't be the church and where the church won't be doing what the church is called to do. So there's no prophecy or no, no kind of uh, foreshadowing or no kind of prescience, no kind of uh, prognostication that will be in a world where the church is not a part of it. This basically signifies the success of Christ in building his church. So here we are some 2000 years hence, and he's still building his church. But Jesus would not have been able to say that with literal vocal cords and a physical body and a larynx and all of that, which is required of a physical body if there was not a body that was prepared for him. If there was no body prepared for Jesus, Jesus would have no body to be the mediator of the world. So what you're not really going to be looking at is how the body of Christ before Christ came prepared for Christ a body for him to die. How the body of Christ before Christ came prepared for him a body before he died. You guys kind of understand what I'm getting at? You and I know that Jesus didn't start at the conception in the womb of Mary. Mary is a Jew. She's a Judite. But there's a lineage of Judites that go all the way back to David. And if it wasn't for a David, there would be no Mary. If it wasn't for a Mary, there would be no Jesus. But if there wasn't for a Jesse, there would be no David. If there wasn't a Boaz, there'd be no Jesse. And on and on and on. So the body of Christ actually prepared for Christ a body in order that he might redeem us. And that's kind of the way I want you and I to hold on to the bookends of what we're dealing with. And, and on a uh, opening level, and you know I take the time opening up because I want to cultivate your thoughts. There are three extremely important leaps that Matthew gives us in Matthew chapter one, verse one. You can look at it. The book of the generations or genealogy of Jesus Christ. And notice how Matthew frames this terse language in verse one. Jesus, the son of David. Do you see that? David, the son of Abraham. Right. So immediately what we have is a tripart genealogy. Tripart. Tri meaning what? Three. 
tripart genealogy, which when you understand theology properly, what you are not looking at is a linear, a literal genealogical line so that David is not Jesus's first and factual father. Neither is Abraham David's first and factual father. All right, so I, I could get into theology around what we call chronology in scripture and show you that chronology is more prophetic than it is literal, where the chronological names of the patriarchs and sometimes the matriarchs as well would intentionally skip people in the family line when they're building a kind of linea, uh, genealogical cord. Obviously, in verse one, what Matthew does not want you to even think about are all the literal cousins and brothers and uncles in between David, Abraham, in between Abraham, David and David and, and Christ. All he wants you to think about are what we call arch patriarchal patterns. The arch patriarch starts with who? Abraham. Is that true? The arch patriarch starts with Abraham, Abraham and Abraham for us is an eminent type of God the what? Father. And we know that this is not like an arbitrary interpretation. Abba, Abba, Ab is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gamel, Daleth, etc. So when we go Abba, Abba, that's the first word in the Hebrew expression, and it means daddy. And that's because God our Father is daddy. And daddy God is the one who begets everyone from his own bowels as the father of all flesh, as the God of all flesh and the father of spirits. So Abraham becomes the father of all of the faithful and he becomes a pattern for us. And Abraham then being a type of God, Abraham then serves in that context, God the father. He serves as what we call cardinal one of the Trinitarian reality of God, cardinal one. Why? Because in the Trinity, we have how many persons? Three persons. Cardinal one is the father. Cardinal two is who? And cardinal three is who? That's exactly right. And these three are one God in the Hebrew. They're one. One true and living God. Three persons. Three distinct persons. One God. Right. So Abraham, Isaac, and who? That gives us our allusion to the what? Trinity. So this is why I say Abraham plays the role of God the Father. And this is why within the framework of the theology of the Old Testament around Abraham, Isaac becomes a Christ type, does he not? Because Isaac is the one offered up on the altar by Abraham the Father. So the son submits to the Father and dies in the behalf of the people for whom the Father loves. That is your radical crystal typology. But I wanted to start with Abraham because Matthew did. And Matthew's a good Jew, but he's a real Christian now. And he says, we go from Abraham to who now? David. And why are we going from Abraham to David? Because we are moving from a patriarchal period in the book of Genesis. So when we follow our Bibles carefully from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers to Deuteronomy, we are moving through the patriarchal period and ultimately, we come to the next major covenant framework, and it's called what? The monarchial period. That's the monarchial period. And so David comes up not in the patriarchal period per se, even though he is a patriarch. Don't get me wrong. He's a father, too, is he not? But Abraham is in the patriarchal uh, uh, framework, and we talk about the Abrahamic covenant. But once we get to David, we are moving now to the what? Monarchy. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. There's a radical break, bridge, breach, break, bridge, breach, break, bridge, breach that distinguished the patriarchal period from the monarchical period in the days of Samuel. When the people of God got tired of God being king. And they asked for a king for themselves. So we're getting ready to lay a foundation. Don't get lost on that. You would have done the same thing. Just, just don't get lost there. I want you to, I want you to follow with me because what I want you to do is cultivate your mind, cultivate, cultivate your mind around how God can make grace abound where sin is present. God knows how to work it out. 
So David is a is a plan that God uses to work out uh, his people's sinfulness. So this is what we want to begin to understand. So David literally in the Hebrew, as we just stated, literally means what? The beloved. And when you think about the beloved, who are we ultimately thinking about? All right. So you might not know this, but if you were studying the uh, difference between how many times the Bible makes mention of Abraham. And Abraham is big in the Bible, is he not? I mean, he's big in our world. He has, he's at the hub of the three most prominent monotheistic expressions of worship, is he not? But do you know that Abraham is diminished significantly in terms of how many times his name is used compared to how many times his great, great, great grandson David's name is used? So let me, I want to help you because I want you to understand where we're going. So I love me some Abraham for a thousand kind of reasons. But you have to understand that when your Bible opens up with Genesis, you're dealing with the what? What does the word Genesis mean? I taught you all that many years ago. S-E-E-D. That's what that means. You don't ever want to miss that. Everything has a seed beginning. Everything. Nothing exists except in seed form. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then once he, once he began his process of creation, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, every day he created, he said, this is what? Good. Once he gets down to the vegetation, the fourth, fourth day of vegetation development, you know what he said? Let everything bring forth fruit of its own kind. Let every seed bearing herb bring forth fruit. So he expects the seed to play a role in the replication and replenishment of life. And so he created Adam and Eve and he told them to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth. So they were seed bearers too. You and I are a product of Adam and Eve, are we not? So from Genesis, we have this developmental history called redemptive history where mankind multiplies in the earth. And God allows them to multiply because God has a seed that he said in Galatians 4 must come. Who is that seed? Jesus. Until the seed comes to whom the promises are made. Galatians 4. So when you read your Bible, Genesis, again, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so forth, just kind of visualize a seed coming. But he's being passed along the lines of genealogical history through natural copulation between men and women who believe God. They're passing that seed down the line by sons and daughters who engage in faithfulness because they know one day Messiah is coming. Well, in the obedience of faith, what God did from Adam and Eve was to make sure that he got from Noah Back here in Genesis 6 to Abraham, here in Genesis 12, all the way up to David in 1 Samuel chapter 13. Y'all got that? And that's something somewhere around three to 5,000 years in what we call biblical chronology, because Abraham comes on the scene, and you can write this down in terms of eschatology. Abraham comes on the scene 2,000 years before Jesus. 2,000 years before Jesus, you can write that down. 2100 B.C., he's born. The end of 2100 B.C., his son is born, Isaac. Remember, they, um, Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Is that right? Okay, so he's called at 2100 years before Jesus. Isaac is born exactly 2,000 years before Jesus. And 1,000 years later, guess who's born? David. David is born 1,000 years before who? Jesus. So what we're dealing with are millennial patriarchs. Abraham is a millennial. David is a millennial. And the final culmination of those two millenniums, which is 2,000 years, Jesus is born about 7 or 6 B.C. Does that make some sense to you guys? Good, because, you know, I, I can't take the time to explain it. You can go in that library back there, dig it up, and we have many studies around it. The reason I make that point is because what I want you to understand is how that history is not arbitrary. Life is not arbitrary. With God, there is no chaos, no confusion. With us, there's all kind of confusion. 
But even in the confusion that you and I are struggling with trying to understand, God keeps everything moving. Telos moves. Life moves. It doesn't stop. You and I ask the food, but God keeps the train going. Absolutely. And one of the eminent ways of what I would call prolifically obvious ways in which we know God's keeping the train going. And, and I'm a pastor. I can share this with you. I do want to get into the text, but I want to cultivate your mind so you can actually enjoy this study so that the day that we all come together on December 26th, your heart will be ready to bust wide open as we celebrate the birth of the newborn king. Um, one of the things we can always know um, in, in terms of God's orderliness and continuity of purpose, we can know that things are being held together by his sovereignty because there are inalienable principles of his divine decree that are never broken like this. Every day people are dying. But every day, five to ten times more people are being born. I tell you every day between 250,000 people are dying to 300,000 are dying, but millions are being born every day. So God knows how to equalize the mortality of human beings and continue his decree of replenishing and expanding. Am I not making sense? All right. And so for a pastor, the juxtaposition is I'll get a call. My mama died. I'm crying and weeping. And then I get another call. And the next call is we just had the baby and I'm rejoicing at the same time. Because that's life. That's life by a sovereign God who keeps it all going. And we got to keep that kind of stuff in perspective. So we have in the opening of our thought from the beloved to the beloved, from Abraham to David. And remember what I said, Abraham is significantly less spoken about than David. I want you to get that. I want you to understand that God had a purpose for David to be talked about 10 times more than Abraham. 10 times more. That's a lot. All right. So in the Old Testament, Abraham's name is used, Abraham, Abraham, the abbreviated version, 175 times. That's pretty busy. That's pretty busy. David is used 1,075 times. That's real busy. Is that busy? Now, and, and think about this. This is remarkable because... David's lifespan covered 40 years. We'll get into that a little bit, maybe next week. Abraham's lifespan in terms of his, his purpose and mission in our life was from 75. At 75 years old, he was called out of Ur of the Chaldee in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12. He had Isaac at 100 years old. He had uh, Ishmael at 83. Abraham lived to be a hundred and how many years old? 75 years old. That means he was called at 75. He died at 175. We had Abraham for how many years? A century. That's huge. But we only got David for 40 years. And yet David is more prolifically talked about on the lips of the people of God than Abraham by 10 times. And here's the reason why. Because the goal of the patriarchal role was the seed in terms of Jesus' humanity. But the goal in terms of the monarchial role is the seed in terms of Christ's lordship. Did y'all get that? Without David, Jesus is not Lord. So I just want you to get that because I'm going to erase my board because you know me. I love writing and I don't have there's not a board I can buy. In fact, one of the saints here built this board because we had one of the boards that we had bought from like Office Max. And it was like about this size. There's no way you can see it back there. And, you know, I would have to erase that thing every 10 minutes. I was so glad when he bought it. I, initially, when Marcus made this board, I was embarrassed like, man, look how big that board is. What am I going to do with that big old board? Y'all see now, it's just, it does not work, does it? But he, he had a vision. That young man had a vision. And so as we, as we lay into this foundation, I want you to think about with me how important David is to Christ and how important David and Christ is to you and me. And I want to go back now to the phraseology. So I want to tag you with the thought of the beloved, the beloved. So when we use the term the beloved, that beloved operates, the term beloved operates out of two things. It operates out of a noun. A noun is a what? Person, place, or what? 
but it also operates as an adjective. And an adjective is what? A description of something. So, it's one thing to say, love your neighbor as yourself. That would be a verb. Because love is a verb. It's another thing to say that God is love. That's a noun. That's a quality of his nature that's essential to who God is. It's another thing to say that God is altogether lovely. That Christ is altogether lovely. And it's another thing when God calls his own son his dearly beloved. Matthew chapter 3, 17. But he calls Jesus his dearly beloved way before Jesus shows up. He demonstrates the preciousness of Christ in every one of God's elect throughout the whole of Scripture. Every time he saves somebody, he's showing us how precious Christ is to him. And particularly when he brings us into the life of David. I want you to think about that for a moment because there are three people that I know that are beloved of God. That is the Greek word rooted in our noun form, agape. Agape. You know, most of you guys hear it translated what? Agape. All right. So that's not the way the grammar really works, but, we, you know, we, we're, not, we're not picking any bones. It's agape. Agape. Now, that's the noun form. The adjectival form that we're talking about is agape. Pay twice. And that's because God wants us to know that the same way he loves David, he loves his son. And the same way he loves his son, guess who else he loves? Us. So if you were to look up the beloved in the New Testament, almost every epistle describes God's people as the beloved. That means you and I share in God's high affection for Christ. In the same way he loves his son, he loves his people. Can y'all get a hold of that? Yeah. I just want you to get that because that's going to help you hold on to the rope as we go through the life of David. Because you might just forget how much God loved David. Just like you can forget how much he loves you when you think about your waywardness and sinfulness and, and your mishaps. It's a good thing he calls you and me beloved before he actually saves us. It's a good thing that I was called the beloved of God before I even had a being. What that means, he loved me in such a way that my personal being could never mitigate his love towards me. Does that make some sense? All right. So it is with Christ. Christ has always been God's beloved. He declared that in Isaiah 42, 49. David has always been God's beloved. We're getting ready to work that through now. But you and I have always been God's beloved too. First John chapter three, two says, beloved. This is the way John puts it, beloved. And is John not the beloved of Christ? Of course he is. He's the one whom Jesus what? Loved. And he says to us in first John chapter uh, three, verse uh, two, and, and he'll catch up with us in a moment up there. First John three, two, beloved. Uh, notice what it says. Now are we called the what? So you see the correlation that the agapetois are really those who are God's what? Children. Huyas. His saints. If you're a saint of God, if you're a child of God, you're beloved of God. That, that, that's all that is. And, and, and now we get to enjoy the juxtaposition of this love as we work through David's life. Um, you read in Matthew 1, 1, these three phrases, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then look over at 17, Matthew 1, 17. We're going to run now for about 25 minutes through scripture with little less commentary on my part. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David unto the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away of Babylon unto Jesus Christ are 14 generations. So from Abraham to David to David to Jesus, uh, how many generations? You go 14, 14, 14 is what? 42. Y'all got that? So mark that number down. I'm not going to teach you biblical numerology today, but we're going to pick it up later because the number 42 is significant. 
He didn't say 43. He didn't say 41. He said 42. And he cut them in three clean, again, tripart categories, right? Um, uh, the first uh, group is 14, 14, 14. That has a theological significance, doesn't it? So we'll come back to that later. But what he wants those reading Jesus genealogy to understand in chapter one of Matthew is, is no accident that Jesus is the son of David. OK, and so now what I want to do is to uh, underscore that that particular qualitative relationship between um, Jesus and David amounts to Jesus lordship as king for the very purpose of God doing something for humanity, which would require the kind of king that David and Jesus would be for us. And here's the next word I want you to put within the framework of your beloved and of your love and all of that. And that's the word mercy. I want you to take the word mercy and understand that the word mercy would mean nothing without the uh, existence of David and ultimately the culmination of David's calling being summed up in the person of Jesus Christ. Watch this. Now, this happened more than you know in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When Jesus comes on the scene and people are in all kinds of predicaments, you run across people who are in the predicament of need. Need. I was talking to a young lady today about that. You and I can be deceived when we are not facing the reality of our need. Because we can frame a conception of our existence on hypotheses and assertions that do not correspond with reality because reality can evade us when we are not needy. Am I making some sense? All right. You can lie to yourself. And when you lie to yourself, you actually change the disposition of your relationship with God also. But there are people for whom trouble in their life is so difficult and so painful. God is kept supremely viewed as their need. Not their convenience, but their need. And so one of the things you would hear all through Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and then particularly in the Gospel of Luke, is this. As Jesus would pass by. A poor, needy sinner, I mean a real poor, needy sinner, would go, Son of David, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. That was the exact reason for which Christ came. He came to show mercy to needy sinners. You guys got that? You got that? That's who the son of David is. He's the one who alone can show mercy to needy sinners. Isaiah 55, 3, keep up with me. I'm going to share with you four verses around that. And then we're going to dig into David's life. I have 30 minutes to do that. And then we'll go into our prayer time. Isaiah 55, 3, listen to this. Incline your ear. That's a call to hear. And come unto me. That's a call to believe. Incline your ear. Come unto me. Watch this. And your soul shall what? That's a promise of quickening. That's a promise of quickening. Watch this. And I will make an everlasting what with you? Now, I want you to, I want you to hold on to that word covenant. We've talked about David. We've talked about the beloved. We've talked about mercy. Now, I want you to take on the word covenant. Because covenant is the contractual agreement that God makes with us in Christ in order to love us, in order to show us mercy. Y'all got that? His mercy and his love to us is always framed in covenant. That means he is obligated to be committed to the terms of the covenant to make sure the blessings he has decreed to pour upon us because of Christ occurs. In other words, God's not whimsical with his love. He is covenantal. In the same way that you and I should be covenantal in our relationships in marriage. Marriage is a covenant of love. Otherwise, it's not a covenant. Am I making sense? 
So when God says, I love you, which he barely uses that terminology, I'll put that in brackets and deal with it later. Because he, he doesn't have to play emotional games with you and me. And the reason why is because love is more of an active verbal expression than it is a rhetorical statement. You can lie to people all day long saying, I love you, I love you, means nothing. If that love doesn't translate into giving to meet a need. Does that make sense? And because God is love, what we presuppose about God's nature is that God is a God that gives. And I summed up in John 3, 16, is it not? For God so loved the world that he what? Right. So love gives because that's the nature of love. But it also infers that that love has qualities and content and properties to give. Like you might want to love somebody, but what if you don't have anything to give? You're not really manifesting love there. Am I making some sense? All right. You can think that through. I know that hurts, but it's true. Um, Because love will give something. Love always gives, it always emits, it always discharges properties to the object of that love so that that person knows that you love them. And it might very well be, just to touch, it might very well be that any in any given situation, so you can take this on, that all a person needs at any given time is to be told that they are loved. At that point, that is a gift. Am I making some sense? It's a gift that reaches to the level of the emotion and the psyche. It affirms the identity and the relativeness of that person's being. Sometimes all I need to know is I'm loved. And that would be true for you and me in terms of God, right? But what God's not going to do is sit around and, 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 and tickle your emotions, having you asking him the question all the time, God, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You see what I'm saying? You're just not going to play God. You're just not going to play God. But listen to what he says. Incline your ear, come unto me here in your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the what? Slow down when you say that. Slow way down. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, descriptive of the sure mercies of David. So what God has for his people are sure mercies, sure mercies, the mercies and they're sure. And they are described as having their content in David. Do you follow that? So I'm laying a foundation for us to see all that David is as a model for what mercy is to sinners like you and me. Because David points to who? And is Jesus not our mercy seat? Is he not the pinata of all merciful blessings to us? That's why, that's why the blind man says, son of, J- son of David, let the pinata bust open and grant me a blessing. Because you're the only one that can do it. You don't have to, but I'm asking you, I love how rich the theology was in the unassuming people in the gospel account. Here this blind man knew more theology than the Pharisees. You didn't find one Pharisee coming to Jesus asking for mercy. How blind could you be? That blind man didn't even see Jesus physically, but he heard him and faith comes by what? When he heard the feet pattering of Jesus' sandals walking by, that brother screamed, Lord Jesus, bust that piñata for me. I know you can open my eyes. I know you can heal my blindness. I know you can save me from my wretchedness. What a, what a glorious truth. All right, let's go to work. Let's go to work. So under my first point, his call as God's man. David's call as God's man. There are four things I want you to see in David's call as God's man. First, his hostile calling. His hostile calling. Not that David was hostile, not that God was hostile, but his calling was in the context of hostility. Can y'all get with that? David wasn't hostile, God wasn't hostile, but the context in which David was called is what? Hostile. Secondly, I want you to see his humility. His humility, the humility of David in his calling is remarkable. And then thirdly, we want to look at his service that leads to his what? His service that leads to his what? Right. And so that's a paradigmatic principle that you and I know, too, that God calls you and me to serve. And that serving leads to success. 
And that's because we are to reflect Christ, who is the ultimate servant. Is that not right? All right. So the motive for which we serve is the fact that our savior served in order for him to acquire that success that makes him sovereign Lord. And then finally, what I want us to look at is David's exaltation. Y'all see that? All right. So let's go to work a little bit. I'm only going to get a portion of this done because it just takes a while to cultivate your thoughts. I pray that the spirit of God will grant you such a passionate love for the story. A lot of you know the story, but if you set your eyes on scripture with a um, desire to see new things, God will show you new things. I'm in first Samuel chapter uh, 13 and I want to read in first Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. I'm going to narrate as I go. Samuel is talking to national Israel because national Israel has finally come to the point of wanting a king like all the other kings of the earth. The kings of Bashan, the kings of the Ammonites had come up and, and waged war against Israel and Israel was a bunch of herdsmen and cattlemen with, 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 with pruning hooks and, and spears, with pruning hooks and, and plows. And here comes this giant army with massive horses and chariots and all kind of war artillery. And it was intimidating to Israel. All Israel had was the ark, the ark of the covenant. And this shining thing that showed up from time to time around that ark called God. So listen to what he says here. But now your kingdom shall not continue. He's talking about King Saul. Because King Saul made a mess of things. We'll see that in a moment. And the Lord has sought him out a man after his own what? All right. So the thing I want you to know about David, the beloved, is that David, the beloved, also reciprocated love. What is reciprocation? When two entities actually act in kind towards one another. That's reciprocation. Right. So watch this. Now, cooperation Maybe I need you to do something for me and you doing something for me. Also, I'm doing something for you, but it may not be the same thing. Cooperation means you will do one thing, I'll do another thing and it will accomplish a goal together. Reciprocation is when you do the same thing. If I hug you and you hug me back, you reciprocate. If I love you and you love me back, you reciprocate. If I meet your need and you meet my need back, you reciprocate. You understand what I'm getting at? So when God says to David that David is his beloved, it's because David has already experienced the love of God that is causing David to reciprocate with God. Now, I don't think I have to convince any of you that David loved God. Do I have to convince any of you? David has a whole song sheet called the Psalms, the Memoir, with all kinds of songs he wrote about God. Right, he was a hip hop artist. You know, he would sit around writing lyrics. When he was at wartime, he was a blues singer. He was a jazz musician. David was all that. He was your, he was your quintessential, uh, metropolitan man. And he loved God and he had no problem expressing his love to God. And God loved him back. And God says, I found a man after my own heart. That would be a goal for you and me, right? Now watch this. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because you have not kept that which the Lord commanded. Now, who is Samuel talking to right now? So watch this. Saul is about to be rejected by God because Saul has rejected God. David is about to be inserted where Saul is about to be uh, rejected. And this is a hostile context that David is being brought up in. And I want you to know that. So under point number one, his hostile calling, look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1 says this, as we are kind of laying the context, we're going backwards now in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. And this is where everything started to become a problem for um for Israel because Samuel's boys were just as bad as Eli's boys in a lot of way. So the judges period is about to end and the kingship is about to occur. Turn with me now to chapter uh, 12 
uh, in chapter 12, look at verse 12, and it states this, 1 Samuel uh, 12, verse 12. And when you saw, this is Samuel talking to Israel, this is what I meant. And when you, talking to uh, uh, King, yeah, Israel, about King Saul coming. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, you said unto me, nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was king. Now, this is Samuel mediating between God and the people. Because like I told you a little bit earlier, when they saw the entourage of the king of Nahash, when he saw that whole group of soldiers and horses and, and all that, they just saw that they had no ability to actually confront that. And on top of that, they didn't have a king. Now, what's operating right now in the life of the children of Israel? One word, unbelief. And what they're about to do is transition from a spiritual dimension of existence to a carnal dimension of existence. Are you hearing me? You guys can see some of our studies tie together now. So sometimes I'm going to be talking about this a little bit tomorrow as I deal with mass formation in our all things COVID class. How hypnosis produces a kind of psychosis that traps men and women in a focus trap and locks them into notions and ideas and longings because they're trapped hypnotically by something they see or hear. This is what's been going on for 18 months in our country, okay, in our world. But what happened with Israel is they were hypnotized by the splendor, the, the, the pomp and circumstance of this pagan nation. And when they looked at themselves, they were tattered sheep herders with forks and plows. But they had the one true and living God. And because of a lack of faith, they were blinded to the Shekinah glory that was always there to protect them and defeat all their foes as Yahweh, Jehovah, Hashim had stated way back in Deuteronomy. I will fight your enemies for you. I will go before you and subdue all your foes. Only you obey the Lord your God. See the predicament we're in now? They want a king like everybody else now. Listen to the next verse. Now, therefore, behold the king whom you have what? And the one whom you have what? And behold, the Lord has set a what over you? Now, I want you to capture this. He's going into explaining to them how they have collapsed into carnal, empirical desires that are rooted in the flesh. Notice how he uses the term. Now, therefore, behold the king whom what? You have chosen. That's the first thing. The king that they're getting is the king that they wanted, the king that they chose. And when they chose, they were engaging in an election process. Because guess what? In choosing Saul, they rejected God. That's called the doctrine of election. Do you understand that? Notice the next thing. Whom you desired. They wanted him. And notice what it goes on to say. Behold, the Lord is giving you what you wanted. This is why I tell the saints all the time, you just don't want God to give you what you want. Okay, you just don't want to do that. Some days you and I are stuck on stupid. And a good daddy, if he loves you, he's not going to give you a snake just because you want a snake. Right? Isn't that what Jesus says? A good father will not give you a snake for eggs, right? Or stones for bread. He's not going to just give you what you want if he loves you. So under our first point, we're dealing with the hostility that is the context around in which uh, uh, David is going to be called. Now look at chapter um, uh, chapter 10, verses 19 through 23. I want us to just kind of get a context here. Chapter 10, 1 Samuel 10, 19 through 23. Now, and he says, and you have this day rejected your God. 
who himself saved you out of all your adversities and tribulations. And you have said unto him, nay, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. So you see how that uh, Samuel had been wrestling with Israel. He really had been warning them. You do not want this. You do not want this. But they kept saying, we want a king. We want a king. And this is where God himself comes into the equation. Look at verse 20 as we go on. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near to the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. The tribe of Benjamin was taken or chosen. Look at 21. When he had caused the tribes of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, they could not find him. Now, if we were to go into the text more, we would understand that God had already told Samuel to go find Saul. And Samuel went and found Saul and told Saul, you're going to be the man for Israel. And Saul said, OK, I guess whatever you want to do, I, I guess I'll take the job. I mean, you know, I, you know I, that's kind of how it was. Now, on the day that all of Israel is to see this man, guess what he's doing? Right. And this was a this was a stark insight into the fact that he really wasn't personally prepared nor qualified. But they're actually, God is actually giving the king, giving them the king after their own heart. Because this is the way Israel was with God too. Just as frightened and unprepared to stand for God as Saul really is here. But Saul will be brought into this. Look at verse 22. Verse 22. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further if the man should come thither. And the Lord answered, behold, he has hid himself among the stuff. We don't know what the stuff is, but he hid. I think this was actually the smartest day of Saul's life. Everything went downhill from here. Look at verse 23. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders upward. This is what we meant by visible optics, reinforcing a deceptive delusion because what God did was chose a man in Israel back in the earlier chapters. It said he was handsome and he was head and shoulders taller than the rest. He's a perfect paper tiger candidate for a king, is he not? This is what we would call in our present day a Manchurian candidate. And I could unpack that. OK, I could unpack that. So God is giving them what they want. And all he's giving them is what satisfies the external fleshly appearance. Ah, oh, we got somebody that we can put dress up, put armor on, put a crown on, and he can represent us to the world. Y'all got that? Doesn't have one fundamental quality to meet uh, in order to actually substantiate this. Now look at chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, because I want you to see it as we walk this through. In 1 Samuel 9, 1 through 3, Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zidar, the son of Bekorah, and the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, verse 2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man. That means handsome and goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person in here. We're talking about physical beauty. We are not talking about intrinsic qualities of character or giftedness. We're talking about external beauty. This Hebrew term for goodness goes back to the Genesis narrative. And she looked upon the tree and saw that the tree was good to look upon. All right. So it's important for you to capture that. It was not an intrinsic goodness. It was an external goodness. He was good in that he would meet the recommendations of the children of Israel. Among the children of Israel, he was, there was no goodlier person. From his shoulders upward, he was higher than any of the people. There it is again. You got a paper tiger in front of you. You got a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now look with me at uh, verse uh, chapter 15, verse 18 through 23. We're laying a, a composite sketch of Saul so we can see the struggle that David is in. And the Lord sent thee on a journey. This is speaking to Saul because Saul is messing up. And he said, go and utterly destroy the sinners of, Am, uh, of the Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Verse 19. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil and did eat, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 20. 
And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and, and, gave, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Now look at verse 21. You guys know the story. We were here a couple of months ago in our study in Romans chapter 8, were we not? But the people took of the spoil and the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord their God in Gilgal. What is the king doing? He's blaming the people for behaving unprincipled under a wartime engagement. He's actually putting the blame on the people. When leadership has to own how the people are behaving. We know the context. Look at verse 23. And Samuel said, hath, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken that, to the fat of rams. Verse 23, summing it up here in this context. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. There it is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you know how long it took for that to happen from the time he was called to the time he was rejected? Two years. He didn't even get halfway through his presidential term. <laughs> chapter 13, verse 2. Chapter 13, verse 2, so we can move to our next point. Chapter 13, verse 2. First Samuel 13, 2, please. Here it is. Uh, start at verse 1. Maybe this is where I want it. S Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned, what, the second year over Israel, this is where all of the things start falling apart, okay? Just in the second year. All right, point number two. This is where the humility comes in because now David is going to be called. We already saw in chapter 13 that God said, I got a man after my own heart, right? He had already told Samuel, Samuel, don't worry about this. They didn't reject you. They rejected me. Now I got my own man. And this is what we want to look at now briefly under his humility. First Samuel 13, 14, we looked at it. Look at first uh, Samuel 16, uh, verse one. Uh, look at chapter 16, verse one and two for now. First Samuel 16, verse one and two. Here it is. And the Lord said unto Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his son. Does God know who his king is? And does God not know that the king that he is calling Dawid, which means in the Hebrew what? He beloved. He, yeah, the one loved of God. He now is going to meet every typical pattern of who Jesus is as the son of David. Dawid is born as a Bethlehemite. Where is Jesus born? Bethlehem of Judah. So what David is about to do is be the seed of which Jesus will be the fruit. The typology is going to get rich over the next several weeks for us. And you want to enjoy it because this is how God works. Look at verse two. Look at verse two. Notice what it says. And Samuel said, how can I go if Saul hear it? He will what? Doesn't that sound like our administration today? And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. So in other words, Samuel had to be surreptitious in his moving about to get to David. Look at verse 11 through 15, because here it is. I want you to see this, what Samuel does in verse 11. It's 1 Samuel 16, 11, please. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all your children? And he said, there yet remains the youngest. Now, uh, another point we want to make. How many sons did Jesse have? How many of you guys know? He had eight sons. Who was the eighth? You guys need to keep that in mind. We'll pick this up next time. But David is the brunt. He's the runt. He's the last. You guys got that? So you guys are going to be seeing a typology pattern starting on Friday between King Saul and King David. I'm going to show you today that King Saul was hated by God and King David was loved by God. King Saul rejected God. King David accepted and received and loved God. This is the doctrine of election. This is the doctrine of distinction between those who love God and those who hate God. Those whom God loves and those whom God hates. Do you guys understand that? This is Cain and Abel. This is Isaac and Ishmael. 
This is Esau and Jacob. Y'all got that? This pattern runs all the way through the Bible. And what's really interesting about this is as David is the least, so Jesus is understood to be the least as well in Israel. So this is how God works in his economy, right? The first shall be what? And the last shall be what? Right. So that's the language you want to capture in understanding theology around the gospel. It's important because God always works through humility to exalt himself. So this is the humility calling of King uh, of, of David. And the text here basically inferred, you ought to know this, that Samuel was looking at all of the younger, older brothers and, and really wanting one of them to be the dude. And daddy wouldn't even have spoken up if Samuel hadn't said, is there anybody else here? Now, I know the Lord woke me up this morning. I know the Lord sent me on this task. David, I mean, Jesse, don't tell me this is it. Because I'd have to even wonder whether or not I was a prophet of the Lord. I mean, I got this thing, go to Jesse's house. I got this oil. I got to pour on somebody. I come here and there's only seven sons. And this shows us how that David had a, 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 a parentage that was very much problematic in his life. That his father did not hold him in honor. This is a paradoxical tension in theology. It's a paradoxical tension, but this is how God works. When my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. That's the Psalms. And that was David. David is amazed because David, you know, when you're the brunt, you, 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 you know, if you're the brunt, you, life is hard. It really is. And here comes God rejecting everybody but the brunt. So David's life is about to turn around. He's getting ready to go uphill. But before he goes uphill, he's got to go downhill some more. Right? Because the, before honor is what? Humility. Verse 13. Verse 12, rather. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready. That word ready there. And with all beautiful, that means he was fundamentally like, like physically endowed, but, but kind of rough with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him for this is he. Now look at verse 13, verse 13. We're almost done. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Do you see that? So I want you to capture this is where we're going to stop today for time's sake. We'll pick this up on Friday and go deeper because there's some juxtapositions here. I didn't have time, didn't want to. I might touch on it next on Friday. God did the same thing with King Saul in earlier chapters, hunted him down. And, and, and Samuel had to take the anointing oil and pour it on the head of King Saul. Here it says, and Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed him. That is David. Inherent in the text is a full anointing. That's inherent in the text, in the grammar. Right. It's the full anointing that really describes what happens to the high priest. And we know this in Psalm 133. The anointing oil that starts at the head and goes all the way down to the feet of Aaron, who is a great picture of our high priest Jesus. David was fully anointed. Saul was only partially anointed. Now, I want to show you what that means, and then we're done here. We'll come back next week. And it's in the text. This is what is called an ep exegetical in the text. So the verse here actually gives you a description, and then it gives you a dynamic. So here's the description. Samuel anoints him, and then immediately the text says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Do you see that language? Now, that only works for people who understand the relationship between symbolism and substance. The symbol is the oil. The substance is the spirit. So, like with water baptism, it's simply a symbol. It has no efficacious content, but it represents the immersion into the death of Christ by the Spirit of God, your union with him, and then up out of that death by the Spirit of God, your resurrection with him. It represents you being endowed fully by the Spirit of God at such a transformational level that you both died and rose again. Only, it could merely be that you got wet. I'd have, I have wet up a lot of people over the years, thousands. 
You can easily go in the water and come out the water the same way. Just wet. Or you could have gone in full of the Holy Ghost and come out fuller. Because the word being mixed with faith creates a dynamic in the event that's transformational. By the way, we will be having baptisms in the beginning of the new year. As we can try to get back to normal, we'll probably be having baptisms for several weeks. As we generally be doing 15 and 20 baptisms a day uh, when we do. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, from that day forward. If you to go back and look at King Saul, the spirit of God did not come upon him when he was anointed. Do you understand that? Albeit God set King Saul up in the earlier chapters to go through this kind of visual optic of an appearance of the king being qualified. He told him after he was back, after he was anointed, I want you to catch up with the sons of the prophet. They're going, you're going to see them walking down the road. And as you catch up with them, I want you to hang out with them because once you start hanging out with them, the spirit of God is going to come upon you and you're going to start prophesying right along with them. And I taught this many years ago. This is a nuanced insight to the text. And I'll close it. This is the difference between Saul and David is that Saul was only a pseudo type of God's man. And David was real. Saul had an appearance of godliness and David was really godly. Saul had an external experience with the spirit of God. David had the spirit of God on the inside of him. Does that make some sense? So when Saul hangs out with the prophet, guess what? The spirit of God comes on Saul. He prophesied and singing and dancing. And then he's wallowing on the ground and, and, and slobbing and, and foaming and everybody. Ooh, it's Saul among the prophets, right? God did that in order to further blind national Israel into their trust in King Saul, because that's who they wanted. He gave them over to a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because we know everything that King Saul did from the very time that he was anointed was in rebellion against God. In two years, his ministry was shot. Now he's going to be king for another 38 years. But the one who's going to emerge is King David. But King David is not going to be a king for another 38 years. But he's going to be operating under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and operating as a leader under King Saul at the same time King Saul exists. But now they're going to be in major what? Conflict with each other. Is that not true? Right. And this becomes a picture for us of the works of the flesh over against the power of the spirit of God. This is what we're going to pick up on on Friday. So this is it for today. We're